Good job. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. All right, um, so this is Matthew 15, 21 to 28. The faith of a Canaanite woman. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Amen. Thank you, Susan. Appreciate that. You guys can have a seat. The title of today is called, Not Worthy, But Unashamed. Not Worthy, But Unashamed. Uh, sometimes we assume that a status of not being worthy or not measuring up means we have to feel shame for it. Like they have to go together. But they don't. They don't have to go together. They often do, of course. You try out for the football team and you don't make it. You can feel shame. You can feel shame in the feeling of being exposed for not measuring up to the way you want to measure up. Being exposed for uh, not being who you want to portray to others. And so you ask somebody out on a date and they reject you. You might feel shame, exposed. I didn't measure up. I didn't make the cut for this person. You get fired from a job. You go to a family gathering and your brother-in-law says, how's that job going? You feel, oh, what do I say? You feel shame. You feel exposed. But in God's kingdom, not measuring up does not have to lead to shame. In fact, knowing that we don't measure up, knowing that we're not worthy, is ac actually a, a prerequisite of sorts for blessing. It's actually a great starting point. It, it's, it's, uh, it's such a great place to actually build our confidence in Jesus' grace. This story that Susan uh, just read for, um, uh, in Matthew 15, it's a story about healing, and we're going to be praying for people who need healing at the end of today. It's a story about Jesus being our healer. We've got a testimony of healing at the end of this sermon that we're going to show on video. But... It's also a story of just having faith, not only in Jesus' power, but his grace. Understanding that because of his grace, he does not require us to measure up. He does not require us to be worthy. He requires us instead, calls us instead, invites us to admit we're not worthy as the starting place. And from that place, to build confidence in his grace. Oftentimes we, we don't come to him for healing and other forms of intervention because of shame. We, we, we think about the things that we've done in the past, something big maybe. We went through a divorce or addiction. A couple of people in here have shared about an abortion where there is shame, there is guilt. And then that leads us to not ask for God to intervene in a big way in our life because we've got that thing hanging over us. Sometimes it's small, little things. We think, man, I had a bad week. I was irritable at work. I was snapping at my kids. And we don't feel like we can ask for God to intervene in our situations, to bring healing to our families, our bodies, our mental health. Sometimes we feel shame for a lack of faith. How ironic is that? We measure our faith. We look at our own faith. Instead of having our eyes on Jesus, which builds our faith, we look at our faith and go, maybe Jesus isn't answering this prayer because I don't have enough faith. Maybe I'm not praying the right way. And that can lead to a form of shame. And it can actually crush our faith and keep us from going to him. I'll admit there have been times, at least a few times a week, where I'll end the day or I'll wake up in the morning and I'll have this low-grade feeling that oh, I let God down. It's not even a conscious thought. It's a feeling that weighs on my soul. And if I don't stop and pause with Jesus to even identify that it's there, if I just get up and rush through the day, it will cloud the rest of my day. This low-grade feeling that I let God down yesterday, I screwed up, snapped at this kid, 
or I didn't respond to this person in the right way, or I didn't get back to that person. Oh, man, I'm doing a bad job. It'll color the rest of the day. If I don't stop in the morning and go, all right, Jesus, where's this feeling coming from? And I can note, okay, identify it and go, wait a second, you're a God of grace. Wait a second. I know it in my head, but I don't always feel it in my soul. And my hope is that this story, as we go through it, that God uses it to fill us with confidence in our souls. That he is not just powerful, but he's full of grace. We don't have to be worthy in order to come to him unashamed, with, with confidence, with audacity, with boldness. Like the woman that we're looking at in this story. So Lord, just open our hearts to see what you would have us see in this story. You inspired Matthew to record this for us. So help us to receive it and it to affect our hearts, our confidence in you, and our actions. Our, our boldness to come to you in times of need, even after we've screwed up. In your name, amen. All right, let's go through this. Verse 21, Matthew 15. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Now, th this region w would be a region of Gentiles, non-Jews. Those who did not believe in or worship Yahweh, the God of the Jews, generally speaking. This particular region, Tyre and, Ty Tyre and Sidon, would be 50 miles away from where Jesus was. So he goes to get away... 50 miles from where he is. That's a long way with a car. Like you want to be alone? I, I, I'll take a walk maybe a mile, right? Two miles. I don't have to go 50 miles away. I don't have to drive 50 miles away. Jesus walked, took his disciples 50 miles away. One has to wonder why that far. One has to wonder, is it just so he could encounter this particular woman on this particular day? We don't know for sure. But I wonder what the disciples were thinking while they're on their way there. Why are we going so far? Why are we going to this region of Gentiles? What is going on? So they get there and this woman, this Canaanite woman comes and she's crying out. She's asking him for help. She would be a non-Jew. She's a Canaanite woman. She's on the outside of the Jewish family. The Jews see her as on the outside of the kingdom of God. She cannot receive the blessings that the children of Abraham get to receive. More than that, she is a descendant of Israel's ancient enemies. So there is uh, uh, just cultural prejudice between these two groups. There, there's animosity. Um, and so the, again, the disciples have to be wondering, what's up with this woman? Then uh, on top of that, it was inappropriate for a woman to address a male, uh, a Gentile woman, to address a Jewish man. Just highly inappropriate, but she does, and she calls him the son of David, which is uh, a reference to his m m messiahship. Like she's a Gentile, and she's acknowledging in some way that he is the heir to the throne of David, something that Jesus' his own people have yet to recognize and, 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 and acknowledge. And believe in. But she does. She sees him. She knows about his miracle working powers. And she comes to him and addresses him as son of David. And, and she has a request for her daughter. Her daughter's demon possessed. And she's suffering terribly. So here's a mom who would do anything for her daughter. Like most parents in here would. There's something about your kid being sick and your, your kid suffering. That makes you stop worrying about whether you deserve something. Stop worrying about whether you can afford something. Stop worrying about whether you have enough to barter with. And it just makes you forsake all forms of dignity. And you're willing to beg and you're willing to plead and you're willing to go through drastic measures to get help for your kid. My daughter Kayla and I just watched the movie John Q. Anybody see it? From about 20 years ago. Denzel Washington plays a father who has a son who needs a heart transplant. Insurance won't cover it. The hospital has, sends the boy home to die. And the mother at that point, says to Denzel Washington, her husband, do something. And he's desperate. He takes a gun. He goes and he takes the hospital hostage until they get their, his kid a new heart. 
He's willing to go to jail. He's willing to get shot at by cops because he's desperate to get help for his boy. I thought of that movie. That's what this woman is. She's pushing aside cultural and ethnic expectations and, and, and etiquette. She's pushing aside what's appropriate between men and women. And she's just desperate. And she goes to Jesus and she says, Son of David, I, got, I need help for my daughter. Help her. In verse 23, Jesus didn't answer her a word. He's quiet. It's like, what's going on with Jesus? We don't know. What's up with that? He's being cold, it might seem, on, on the surface. But as we'll see, he is drawing something out of her that he wants to use to showcase to his disciples and then to all of us who will read this account. There's something about her that we can all learn from, but by him being quiet, it's going to draw more out of her that he wants us to see. The disciples, they respond by saying, send her away. She keeps crying out after her. So it's this picture of them perhaps traveling along. And it's not just one time. She's been saying, son of David, son of David, heal my daughter. Heal my daughter. Like just not leaving them alone. And the disciples are like, hey, can you just, can we get, get rid of her? Now that phrase, send her away, um, it, it could actually be translated like give her what she wants and get rid of her. Not just like ignore her need, but give her what she wants and get rid of her. Uh, it shows up in the book of Luke where the request is actually granted. So it's possible they're like, hey, just can you fix her daughter so she can stop bugging us? You know, that, that, that's, that, that's possibly what they're asking of Jesus. But Jesus is after something bigger than a miracle of healing here. He's after something bigger than a miracle of healing here. And, and, and I think he's after something bigger than a miracle of healing for some of you today. That's what we're after. We, we want more than a miracle of healing. There's more. There's more. Verse 24. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. So he answers her, finally, and he says, my ministry is to the Jews. I came for the Jewish people. I came for my own people. And indeed, that was his priority. God the Son came to proclaim the kingdom is here to the people of Israel. God's plan since the time of Abraham was that Israel is the source of blessing to the rest of the world. And so Jesus came to announce the kingdom to his own people, but not until he dies, rises again, ascends into heaven, and pours out his spirit on his disciples, then is the gospel meant to go to the nations. So he's saying, hey, right now, this is the phase where I'm focused on Israel, not you Gentiles. Now, again, this seems cold. This seems... Um, like it lacks a great deal of compassion that we would expect to find in Jesus. But again, he's drawing something out. He's up to something here. He's up to something here. Now this woman, um, she perhaps knows this. She knows that his focus is on the Jews. But she's still asking him anyway. She's got such audacity coming to him, right? She, she perhaps knows this plan. And yet she's like, hey... Can you interrupt this plan for me? Right? She's got such audacity. She comes and kneels before him. She doesn't stop. Lord, help me. Kneels before him. That's a picture of worship. Other versions actually that you might have might say worship. She knelt down in a uh, posture of worship. Lord, she calls him Lord, help me. She doesn't stop. She doesn't let Jesus telling her that I only came for the Israelites. She doesn't let that stop her. It only increases her fervency. Verse 26. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Like, wait, what? Children's bread to the dogs. So children's bread is a reference to the privilege of being on the inside of God's kingdom. And Jesus is saying, listen, healing, this, the implication is that healing, deliverance, is for those on the inside of God's kingdom. That's who it's for, my dear. It's not for those on the outside. And sorry, but that's you. You're a Gentile. You're, you're, you're part of the, the Canaanites. You're part of Israel's ancient enemies. You, 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 you're not on the inside. That's what he's saying. Now it seems prejudiced. It seems um, heartless. 
He's called, he calls her dog. That's what uh, Jews often refer to Gentiles as, as dogs. But the way Jesus says dogs, it's not really uh, reflected here in the NIV translation, but it's kind of this tone of like little puppy. Like he kind of changes it a little bit. Uh, like, like, not, not let a wild dog, like I'm not going to, you know, give what the children's bread to those wild dogs. He said, like, but to the, to, the, to, the, to the household pet, that's kind of the idea. You, you don't give the children's food to the household pet. And indeed, in our families, we, we see this, right? I have a, a one and a half year old lab. She doesn't get our, my kid's food. We, we set out the table for the kid's dinner. The dog gets the dog food. If we were in some kind of crisis where we couldn't afford dog food and we only had a certain amount of rations of food, the dog isn't going to get one of my kid's plates of food. Right? The dog comes last. And Jesus is saying that to the woman. Again, it seems prejudiced and heartless, but Jesus is up to something. He's drawing something out of her. On the surface, he's referencing the priorities to the, to the Jews. Uh, but underneath the surface, I think with his tone that we can't really get from the written word, right? I think with his tone, right, he's, he's sort of teasing her, but he's teasing something out of her. Verse 27. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. So she doesn't stop. She's not like, oh, you're right. Okay, you know, I guess, I guess, I guess that's it. She doesn't do that, which is what many of us will do when we feel like we haven't measured up, like we're not worthy. Oh, all right, I guess, okay, walk away, you know. Guess I didn't measure up today. We'll do that in prayer. Like, oh, I can't go to God in prayer. Maybe I can have my pastor pray for me today, but not me. Oh, man, if the parties I just went to this week, I can't pray to God. Maybe my pastor can pray. Hopefully he had a good week, right? That's what we do. Hopefully he wasn't at those parties. This woman doesn't stop, though. She's like, oh, it's okay, I'm a dog. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine, I'm a dog. But even the dogs get the scraps, she says. She doesn't try to say, but I've been good, and you know what, I called you son of David, so I, I should be, she doesn't do that. She doesn't barter, she doesn't point to herself. She's like, yeah, that's fine, I'm a dog, that's cool. But the dogs get the scraps. And indeed, in my house, my dog will get scraps that fall underneath the table. And if one of the kids go to the bathroom, and we're all paying, playing banana grams at the table, all of a sudden, we'll look, and the dog's on the table, getting a hamburger, and running off. <laughs> She'll get some scraps. And the woman is like, yeah, even the dogs get the scraps. That's me. I'm a dog. Give me the scraps. Give me the scraps. Give me the leftovers. Give me the trickle. Give me the overflow. Give me what many of your own people are rejecting and saying, well, I don't want. You're not the Messiah. She's like, give me some of that. Just give me the little bits. She's not backing down. She's not backing down. She's showing a great deal of faith in God's plan and promise to Israel to, to overflow to the Gentile nations. But she's saying, can we hurry up that plan and can I get some of those future blessings now? The blessings that you have in store for the Gentile nations in the future, can you give me some of that now? Because my daughter's suffering. Hurry this plan up. Shameless audacity while recognizing she's not worthy. Right? See that combination? Verse 28, Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. So Jesus praises her faith, her faith to her face, which is the first time this happened in the book of Matthew. Jesus has not praised anybody's faith like this. He did it to the Roman centurion at one point, who, by the way, was also a Gentile. But he sort of turned to the crowds and said, what great faith this man has. In this case, I think it was more like, woman, he got up close to her. You have such great faith. I was teasing you. I was messing with you a little bit because I wanted you, I wanted your faith, your audacity to shine in this moment so that my disciples could see it, right? Because they don't have the same kind of faith that you do. You kept pushing through, and that's awesome faith. You didn't just have faith in my power. You had faith in my grace, recognizing that you don't deserve it, because none of them do. Not even children of Abraham deserve it. But you recognize that you don't deserve it, and you kept pushing through anyway, because you were confident in my grace. What great faith you have, you had. So he was testing her faith, but not testing it in the way that we think of testing, like pass or fail, or like Jesus grades our faith, right? He doesn't do that. He doesn't give an A or a B, and you know what? Today, I can't answer your prayer because your faith is like a C. If you prayed yesterday when it was like an A, I would have granted it, but today, 
It's a see, wait a few days, right? He doesn't do that. That's not what he, but he tests our faith in, in a way that fire purifies gold, right? Fire tests and purifies it. The impurities ride to the surface so you can scrape away those impurities. And that's what he does with us through our difficult circumstances and situations. T- stuff rises to the surface so he can peel it away and purify our hearts. Or like when you go to the gym to work out and, and you, you use weights, it tests your m- muscles. It puts them to the test so that they're uh, stimulated to, to grow more. And Jesus was drawing out of her something that his disciples would not have seen if he granted her request right away. If she came, can you heal my daughter? And he said, sure, go ahead, she's healed. His disciples would not have seen her persistence, her audacity, her boldness, her willingness to push through Jesus' comments. Right? So yeah, does does he test our faith? Absolutely. He tests it in order to reveal what's in there in order to strengthen it and grow it. Not to pass or fail or grade it. Not like that. Not like that. So three lessons for us. Number one, if you belong to Jesus, you're a child of God and healing is the children's bread. We're going to have some prayer team members down front after service. If you need healing of any kind, physical, mental, relational, come down. We'll pray for you. Our team members will pray for you. If you're a child, if you belong to Jesus, then you're in the kingdom of God. You're a child. You're adopted into his family. And, and healing, an implication, we see this all throughout Jesus' ministry, all throughout the book of Acts, healing is, is, is an aspect of the kingdom of God. It's an aspect of the kingdom of God. It's, 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 it's a part of it. And it, we don't earn it. We don't get saved by grace and then earn healing. That's not how it works. Jesus paid for it. He went to the cross, paid for our adoption, and then we, we're in his kingdom. We're in his family. Now, we get, uh, 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 when he returns, we're going to get the full inheritance of being children of God. Full salvation from the presence of sin. Full salvation from the presence of sickness. No more dealing with either one. But now, we get big chunks of it. Pieces of it. Hints and foreshadows of it. Um, It's sometimes, I'll share a story. When I was about 12 years ago, 2010, I had, my back was out. And it was out, um, it was an old high school football injury that got re-injured. And it was so bad at this time. I was like months where I'm like walking like this. I'm sleeping with ice packs. I'm driving with ice packs. I had this back thing in the car. I couldn't drive without it or I would be in so much pain. Like I remember use, I had a stick shift at the time and just using the clutch. I was like, oh, it was killing me. Shooting down my leg. I was going to the chiropractor. I was on this machine that would like do this to me for like an hour. It was constant. It was months and months of this. And I remember one particular night, I had to meet my wife up in North Jersey for a dinner with some of her coworkers. I had some, I was coming from a high school, some kind of presentations in Monmouth County somewhere for uh, the pregnancy center up there. And I, I, my plan was to stop at our, at our place in Seabright, where we lived at the time, to get the thing from my back for the car and the ice pack that I used for the car to drive up. I wouldn't have made it. Like I was so, in so much pain. So I was, that was my plan. But I mismanaged my time. I didn't get to stop home to get the thing from my back. So I'm on the parkway and I'm in so much pain, right? And I'm like, oh, how am I gonna, how am I gonna make it there driving, let alone sit through this dinner and be present? And I was kind of kicking myself because I mismanaged my time, right? You know how those low-grade guilt things you get? You're like, oh, you stupid. You, you mismanaged your time again. You're so unorganized. You didn't have time to stop and get the back thing in the ice. And if you're thinking you could have stopped at a gas station to get ice, no, no, those things leak and then I'm all, you know, all wet. That's not, wouldn't have worked. So I needed this special ice thing that I had in my house. And I didn't have time. So I'm, I'm beating myself up. And I'm kind of saying, Lord, heal me. But I'm kind of like, I don't really deserve it because I mismanaged my time. And I was a stupid one today. And as soon as I had that thought, I got hit with the other thought. Which is, but that's the point of the gospel. You don't deserve it. That's the point of the cross. That's what Jesus did. He came and died for you. He, he paid for you. You don't earn anything. You don't earn any of the blessings of the kingdom of God. And so I had that thought and I said, Jesus, I said, can you just heal me tonight? Can you take away this pain tonight? We'll we'll worry about tomorrow tomorrow. Just take it away tonight. I know I don't deserve it. And that's the point. So give me your your gracious healing touch. And this has only happened a handful of times in my life. But instantaneously almost, my, my back pain went away. Instantaneously, it went away. I was able to drive the rest of the way. I was able to sit through dinner, actually forget about my back, and leave there and go like, wait, the back, my back is fine. And it was gone. It never came back. 
Even, even when I re-injured it again a few years later, it was, it was like a 2 compared to that, being a 10. It never came back. That moment of recognizing. Now, had I been prayed for many times up to that point? Absolutely. Nothing happened. But in that moment, there was something about realizing, wait a second, I don't even deserve healing. And that's the point of the gospel. Jesus, be gracious. And he did. So we're going to pray for anybody who's a follower of Jesus. Now, what if you're not a follower of Jesus? Well, that's number two. If you're not a Christian, you don't have to become one in order to receive the benefits of the kingdom of God. You get to be prayed for too. You don't have to become a Christian. We're not going to be like, hey, you need to become a Christian right now before we pray for you. No, no, no. We're not going to do that. We'll pray for you. God, God will my heal you. But sometimes what happens is we see this in the Bible. We see this in life. Jesus shows up in our lives in order to point us to him and draw our hearts to him and say, hey, I'm alive. I'm at work. I'm intervening in your life. But more than any of these blessings, I want you. I want a relationship with you. I want you to grab hold of the forgiveness that I've paid for at the cross. And so we're going to pray for you, but we're also going to um, receive communion together in, in our response time. So that's number two. And then lastly, number three, uh, you don't hyperanalyze your faith. Just worship Jesus for his power, his grace, and, and your faith will grow as, as a byproduct. Don't get so worked up, double, oh, do I have enough faith right now or not? Th that just gets your eyes on yourself. I thought of this this morning. When my kids were younger, they used to jump off things. Like, you know, picture the stage here, right? Or the stairs in my house, trampoline. They jump off into my arms, right? They weren't thinking, do I have enough faith, Daddy, to jump in your arms, right? They'd just respond. They'd see me, and they'd respond by jumping. Or they'd not jump. They're either jumping or not jumping, but one thing they weren't doing is measuring how much faith they had. One kid might jump into my arms with a little bit of fear, Another kid might jump into my arms with a lot of fear, but still jump. I didn't base whether I caught them on, well, you, didn't, you had too much fear. I, I ain't catching that. I'm not rewarding fear. No. I'm so good. They jumped, so I'm catching them, right? So we go to Jesus, and as we go to Jesus, and as we experience him, and as we grow, our faith grows, and we have bad days. That's not the, that's not the point. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't make us earn any blessing based on how much faith we, we have. The point is him, right? Our faith should draw us to him, even in moments of weak faith. Just jump. Jump into his arms. Move to him. What we're going to do now is um, watch a testimony. I was not supposed to preach this message originally. Uh, John Soper, who is a guy that you, many of you have, have, have met, he preached here a year ago. He did our last leadership training on evangelism. He is an um, older gentleman who um, has been mentoring me in, in areas of ministry. Um, he was supposed to preach on this. He's got an interesting story. He suffers from cerebral palsy since he was a kid. He has yet to be healed from that. He's prayed for other people to be healed of that, and they have been. He's, got, he's, he's seen other people healed miraculously. So he was supposed to come preach on this and talk about some of that. I instead did a Zoom interview that I'll be releasing this week. A little supplemental resource. Uh, watch it midweek. Um, it's a you know, great conversation that we had. Ask some questions. Um, how do you reconcile this? How do you reconcile God? You've seen God heal people while you pray for them. And then God not healing you of this. What's up there? So we talk about that. Um, but I want to show you just one piece of that interview now about somebody who was healed after John prayed for them, but John didn't even pray for healing. So, hit, oh, I'll, I'll hit play. Or you hit play. I've heard you share a, a particular um, testimony of a, uh, a time that you were called to a hospital. Was it a Jewish man or a Jewish woman? It was a Jewish woman. Let me tell you the story. Yeah. I, I had just finished uh, preaching one Sunday morning in one of the churches we planted in South Jersey, down in Pomona. And a man came to me after the service. He'd never, he'd never been there before. I'd never seen him before. And he obviously had been much moved. He, he told me that uh, he had come back to Christ that morning. And then he repeated his story, uh, which boiled down briefly, was that he, he had committed his life to Christ and then Going through a number of hard things. Uh, his business failed. He, he lost his marriage. And uh, through all the circumstances, the difficulties, he, he lost his faith for a while, walked away from the Lord. That day, he came back to Jesus. 
and he was weeping and I was weeping with him and um, just encouraged him and uh, prayed with him. And, and just as we were leaving, he said, uh, do you make hospital calls? Well, obviously I make hospital calls. I'm a pastor. Uh, yeah. Uh, who needs a visit? Well, I have a friend and she's very sick and she's in the hospital. Would you go see her? And I said, sure. What hospital? What name? And he gave me the name. And the hospital was probably seven minutes from my house. So that afternoon, after I'd had lunch with the family, I went to the hospital. Now, a few things he forgot to tell me. The, the first thing he forgot to tell me is that the woman wasn't just really sick. She had a really uh, infectious case of hepatitis and she was in the isolation ward. And as I'm getting gowned and, 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 and robed and sent into this infectious ward, I thought, you know, it'd be nice if he told me that ahead of time. Still would have gone, but would have been nice to know. Second thing he forgot to tell me was this wasn't just a friend. This was uh, his uh, partner. He was cohabiting with a woman. They, they weren't married. And hey, I still would have gone. That's not an issue. Um, it would have spared both her and me a little awkwardness <laughs> in, in the introductions as I was trying to figure out who was who and, and, and what the relationships were. Yeah. The third thing that he forgot to tell me <laughs> was that she was the daughter of an Hasidic rabbi. Ah. Of course, the Hasidim were the strictest sect of the Jews. And uh, living in central New Jersey, you know all about the Hasidim. Uh, and again, I still would have gone. Probably would have taken something more than the New Testament I had in my back pocket at the time. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, was, it was obvious that she was really, really sick. She had hepatitis. The doctors had told her, be prepared to stay in the hospital for two weeks. Uh, her skin was was orange, and I'm colorblind, but I could see that. And uh, I, I made a mental note of all these things in that first few seconds and uh, so, sort of determined I'd stay 10 minutes, pray with her, which is proper etiquette in that kind of a situation. If the patient's not going to die uh, and it's your first visit, you've never met them, uh, you're going to introduce yourself, you're going to pray for them, and you're going to come back when they feel a little better and, and uh, talk some more. But she wouldn't let me go. Uh, as soon as she found out who I was uh, and who had sent me, uh, she started asking questions, one question after another, after another, all about the Bible. And uh, uh, the gist of all the questions was, how can you be so sure that Jesus Christ is really Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah? I answered the questions, and I, I was conscious time was going on, uh, the duty nurse, nurse uh, kind, kind of came by the room and glared at me a couple of times. So I knew that she thought it was time for me to leave. And, and finally, after a half an hour, I said, look, um, you're getting you're getting tired. I could see she was getting weaker. Mm. <laughs> I didn't want to kill the lady. So uh, I said, how about if I pray and uh, I'll come back in a few days when you're feeling a little better and we can talk some more. And so that agreed upon, I prayed a very simple prayer. I didn't ask God to heal her. I said, Lord, please show my new friend that Jesus Christ really is Yeshua HaMashiach. And I left, went home. About an hour and a half, two hours later, my telephone rang. And when I picked it up, back in the days when you still had to pick up a corded line, uh, there was a voice babbling incoherently on the other end of the line. And when I calmed them down, here's the story I got. About five minutes after I'd left that hospital room, the duty nurse came in the, doing the, the, the hourly rounds on the sickest patients and noticed that this lady's face wasn't orange anymore. Hmm. When she took her temperature, it wasn't 104. That's what it had been when I was there. It was now 98.6. And she called mm. the uh, the intern on duty, the doctor on duty, 
and and he came in the resident and and uh, ordered a blood test. And about an hour later, the blood test came back from the lab. No signs of hepatitis in this lady's body. Holy she God. had been healed. Holy the next God. day, I went back Monday morning, 11 o'clock, and uh, met her. And uh, in almost 50 years of ministry now, I don't think I've ever seen anybody come to Jesus more quickly or more enthusiastically than that lady did because she had discovered that Jesus Christ really was Yeshua HaMashiach. Mm. And uh, that kind of has been a pattern that I've seen repeated, not, not every week, not every month, not even every year, but over and over again through the, through, through the 50 years of ministry, Christ meeting people, especially people who are on the outside looking in, trying to figure out if Christianity is really what it says it is, mm -hmm. and Jesus is really who said he is, who he said he is. And uh, over and over again, I've seen that happen as people meet Jesus as he heals them and then brings them to new life and to faith in him. Mm. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. You can watch the full interview on um, midweek. So here's how we're going to end. Ben, you can come on up here. Uh, we're going to have stations today, a little different than normal. Um, down here, instead of, this is Communion Sunday, we're going to, normally we pass out the communion elements, we receive it all together. Um, but just picturing this woman, just with, with her audacity, con constantly bugging Jesus, right? She's moving, she's following, she's kneeling down, she's worshiping. Um, so instead, we're going to move to receive communion. If you're receiving communion with us, the elements are down here at this table underneath this cross. You can come down and get it. But what's, what's near here are, are no index cards, with pens. And so if there's anything that you are tempted to feel like uh, disqualifies you from the, the blessings of Jesus, from Jesus intervening in your life, maybe you're a Christian and yet you have these nagging thoughts of, yeah, but I can't ask for anything more than one day to go to heaven. In the meantime, I'm going to just have to, you know, deal with X, Y, and Z because I don't deserve it because of X, Y, and Z from my past. So these are index cards where if you can identify anything in particular, that makes, that tempts you to feel like you're unworthy, which you are, <laughs> write it down. And then put it in the basket underneath the cross as just a confession that, that's right, I am unworthy, but you paid for this. I am unworthy, but you paid for this. Yes, I screwed up my marriage, but you paid for that at the cross. Yes, I still battle with this addiction, but you paid for this at the cross. You stick it in that basket, right? So, before you grab the communion element, if there's anything that comes to mind that you just need to confess and then celebrate has been paid for, stick it in that basket, grab the communion element, and you can go back to your seat. Now, number two, we're going to have people here who are willing to pray for anybody who needs healing of any kind, as I indicated. So Scott and Camille, Donna, Bill and Debbie, um, would you come down here? You guys were the ones who said you were available. Would you guys come down here? Maybe... Uh, Two sets of you on one side, one of you on the, on the other side. So these guys are available to pray. So Scott and Camille, Bill and Debbie down here. Donna will be over here on the other side of the speaker. If you want to receive prayer for healing of any kind. So that's what we're going to be doing as the band leads us in singing about how great our God is. So can we stand? Come down at any point, receive communion, drop index cards in, receive prayer for healing, do it in any order you want. Thank you.